The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the traditional Catholic faith and religion as professed and practiced by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of the Second Vatican Council and the so-called New Order of Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. This is the second part of the treatment of St. Pius X's encyclical, Pascenti Dominici Gregis, condemning the errors of the modernists. In the first part of the treatment of the encyclical Pascenti, he talked about St. Pius X's uh, referring to modernists and modernism as the greatest threat to the faith, the greatest threat to the church that the church has ever known. In fact, we might actually say, uh, with good reason, that the modernists are, buildy, are busy building the anti-church to be the church of the antichrist. That might seem a little bit extreme until you read the encyclical of St. Pius X all the way through and then you understand the gravity of the situation. Well, the first part talked about St. Pius X's grave concern for the threat that modernism and the modernists posed to the church. He said it is the greatest threat the church has ever known. It's time that the Catholic people take note of St. Pius X's concern and make it their own and realize how grave the situation is. Only then can we understand the current crisis that the church is going through and understand that it is not the Catholic Church that has done these evil things, but it is the modernists who have seized power and control in the structure of the church. Now, as I mentioned last time, <coughs> finishing on my first part, uh, St. Pius X gives us the division of the encyclical that he's writing here. He calls the modernists by their proper name modernists and says that they are commonly and rightly called by this name. He says they employ the clever artifice by presenting their ideas in a, in a confused manner. And this is to, number one, ward off being charged with uh, basically the heresies that are inherent in their system, but also to make it look as though they're rather tentative about the beliefs and that they're still open to quote-unquote dialogue about them, which they're not, <clears throat> but also to throw off the trail anybody who would analyze their beliefs and show how heretical they are. So St. Pius X said, that he wanted to bring together into one grouping their teachings, the essential principles of modernism, and point out the connection between the, Protest the, the principles and show that they are actually a cohesive system, a very anti-Catholic coherent system, and then to examine the sources of the errors and also to prescribe the remedies for averting the evil that they threaten against the church. And uh, continuing then, I mentioned that St. Pius X uh, said that in order to proceed in an orderly manner in considering modernism, we have to look at the modernist and his, his uh, various roles or personalities. He says every modernist sustains and comprises with himself many personalities. So St. Pius X distinguished the modernist as a philosopher and as a believer, and as a theologian, as an historian, as a critic, as an apologist, and as a reformer, these seven roles, these seven, as he called them, personalities. So uh, St. Pius X is going to look at each one of these in turn and explain the thinking that goes into the mind of the modernist, starting with the modernist as a philosopher. And uh, he goes on to talk about the different roles as they are distinguished from one another. He starts by talking about the agnosticism of the modernist as a philosopher. <clears throat> and so you see the heading in the Vatican's own site giving us this encyclical, the Pascendi. The introduction to this section six, six is agnosticism and its philosophical foundation. And so St. Pius X says, we begin then with the philosopher. It says, modernists place the foundation of religious philosophy in that doctrine which is usually called agnosticism. 
Now this is where people begin to cloud over a little bit because most people haven't really had an introduction to philosophy, uh, let alone the philosophy, the philosophical concept of agnosticism. I mean, the word agnostic is commonly used in the English language to designate someone who does not know whether there is a God or not. Okay? But philosophically, agnosticism means much more than that. And uh, the, remember, we're talking about the modernists now, insofar as they are schooled in the Catholic faith, insofar as they have a background in philosophy and theology, which is why St. Pius X says that they're so dangerous. And we're talking about members of the clergy. We're talking about those in the priesthood. And we're not just talking about priests. We're talking about bishops, too. That St. Pius X was trying to bring back to their Catholic sense, and they would not come. So when we're talking about the modernist as a philosopher, we're talking about kind of going into, into deeper waters here where many, many people who do not have that training are not really willing to go and not necessarily equipped to go. <clears throat> so when we say, when we quote St. Pius X as saying the foundation of religious philosophy for the modernist lies in the doctrine called agnosticism, we have to understand exactly what he means by that. It's a technical term for philosophers. And what it says is that human reason is in, entirely confined within the field of phenomena. Now, while now we're talking about another philosophical concept, phenomena, that whole concept of the human reason being confined within the realm of phenomena gives us another ism besides agnosticism. It gives us also phenomenalism. And this is, again, where many people kind of lose their way. It's important to understand these two concepts, and uh, I'll try to explain them a bit off the cuff, but I hope that they, what I say will be intelligible. When they talk about the field of phenomena, they're talking about the things that are perceptible to the senses. Okay, this is what St. Pius X says. And he goes on to explain this. He says, first of all, the human mind, essentially, is incapable of lifting itself up to God and of recognizing his existence. So this is the first theory, you might say, the first principle of agnosticism, which is based upon the idea that human reason is limited to mere phenomena. That the human mind is incapable of lifting itself to God and of recognizing even the existence of God. And certainly not recognizing the existence of God as they are, that existence of God is indicated by the things created. Now here we see exactly the denial of St. Paul's words to the Romans that we can know God through the things that he created. The modernist denies that. He says, we must be agnostics in our way of thinking because human reason cannot decipher from the things created, cannot decipher the existence of God. We'll return to this idea in a minute. Secondly, from this, it is inferred by the, by the modernist that God can never be the direct object of science because science, again, is limited to the world of phenomena. And because science is the application of reason to the things that are perceptible only to the senses, and we can't learn from the things of the senses, the things created, anything about a creator, that therefore science must be officially without God. It must be godless. And thirdly, St. Pius X says, the modernist, as an agnostic, as a phenomenalist, must hold that God cannot be considered a subject of history, that in terms of history or even historical science, God has no, th no part. God cannot be known, and it would be a violation of, uh, of human reason, actually, to place God within science or, or understand in science any influence of God. And fourthly, a, the conclusions continue to come from their basic principles of agnosticism and phenomenalism, that given these premises, that natural theology is completely done away with. There is no such thing as natural theology that is born of human reason. 
Uh, theos, hoteos, in Greek, means God. And theology is speaking of God or the science of God. There can be no science of God. By the use of reason, we can know nothing of God by reason, is what the modernist is saying. The motives of credibility, I mean, the motives of credibility, which we learn from the Gospels, are the miracles that our Lord worked and others too. Those are all swept away. You cannot have those. They're not permitted in history. And uh, also external revelation, God speaking to us through our power of understanding, through our power of reason, God making truths known to the human intellect impossible. The human intellect cannot grasp these things. And so the modernists have simply done away with any role of human reason in knowing truths of God, divine revelation, motives of credibility and miracles, even God's own existence, his simplicity, his infinity, his goodness, and all of the other things that the philosophers can tell us about God, the modernist simply uh, completely throws them all away. It says, no, we accept none of that, discards them and utterly. And uh, by the way, anyone who tries <clears throat> to pretend that the human intellect has any power <clears throat> to know of God, to know his existence, to know of his basic attributes. Anyone who claims that the human intellect has the power to know this from the things that God created is, is dismissed as an intellectualist. Uh, intellectualism is the term the modernists use to uh, basically, it's a pejorative to just dismiss anyone who would claim that the human intellect has the power of knowing anything about God, even his existence. Now, the Church has formally condemned these ideas. The First Vatican Council has defined the fact that the human intellect has the power to know of God, his existence, and his basic attributes. And I read from the encyclical, actually. These are, these are statements from Vatican I, and these are, these are dogmatic statements of Vatican I. The first of it, the first statement is this, if anyone says that the one true God, our Creator and Lord, cannot be known with certainty by the natural light of human reason, by means of the things that are made, let him be anathema. <clears throat> and this statement refers to St. Paul's own words in sacred scripture that God can be known from the things that he created. This is from De Revelazione, Canon 1 of Vatican the First Vatican Council. <clears throat> let him be anathema is a condemnation saying, let him be out of the church, let him not be considered a Catholic. He's excommunicated from the church by a denial of faith. He's a heretic. If anyone says that the one true God, our Creator and Lord, cannot be known with certainty by the natural light of human reason, by means of the things that are made, exactly what the modernists deny, let him be anathema. So you begin to see right from the start here the analysis of the modernist thinking why St. Pius X ultimately comes to this statement that modernism is a synthesis of all heresies. And he starts with this one, their agnosticism, denying something divinely revealed in sacred scripture and in sacred tradition, that God can be known by the power of the human intellect. Secondly, St. Pius X Quotes from, from the First Vatican Council, again, De Revelazione Canon 2. If anyone says that it is not possible or not expedient that man be taught through the medium of divine revelation about God and the worship to be paid him, let him be anathema. Again, the modernist completely undercuts the idea of the human intellect receiving divine revelation. Let him be anathema. And thirdly, St. Pius X quotes, from the uh, apostolic, uh, from the dogmatic decree de fide, if anyone says that divine revelation cannot be made credible by external signs, and that therefore men should be drawn to the faith only by their personal internal experience or by private inspiration, let him be anathema. So again, on a third count, modernism falls to the acts of truth here, of the divine divinely revealed truth expounded here by the First Vatican Council. If anyone says that divine revelation cannot be made credible by external signs, there you have the phenomenon. 
There you have the phenomenal world that we live in, the modernists say, through the things that are created, in other words, that if we cannot arrive through the external creation at a knowledge of God, if anyone should say that, oh, therefore all we have left is faith as an experience, a personal internal experience, we're getting to that part of modernism that tries to supply for what they've just destroyed in the intellect, but, but trying to supply it by experience, personal experience. St. Pius X is anticipating that. It's as though the First Vatican Council was anticipating that back in 1869 and 1870. It's explicitly mentioned what the modernists would come to teach, or by private inspiration, let him be anathema. <clears throat> Here you have three hammer blows, three hammer blows against the fundamental principle of modernism, the place where the modernist begins with agnosticism, that we cannot know God through the things that God created. We cannot know him by the power of human reason. <clears throat> now, it's important for us to realize the significance of this denial of the modernist, this denial that human reason, that the human mind can know God <clears throat> by its own natural powers. It's important for us to see the sig significance of that denial. Because you read right in the first pages of Genesis that God created man and in his image and in his likeness. <clears throat> and we, we read uh, in the fathers of the church and the theologians of the church that are approved by the authority of the church that when we speak of man being created in God's image, we're referring to the fact that God made man's soul uh, spiritual and immortal by God himself but also endowed that soul with faculties, powers, <clears throat> the power of intelligence to know the truth, to know what is truth, not only individual truths, but to know what truth itself is. And that God gave man the power of will, to, know, to love what is good. It is the very nature of the will as a power uh, by which God has endowed man with the ability to love what is good. And uh, that the, the intellect and the will working together enable us to enjoy what is beautiful. This is what gives us what the philosophers call the transcendentals. The true, the good, and the beautiful. Truth, goodness, and beauty are exactly what we are created for as human beings. And here we find the, the image of God in man. <clears throat> but you know that an image is something that is ex kind of external. It, it does not go to the very core of the being. An image we might say that about a, a young boy who we say is the image of his father, meaning that he appears, he looks like his father. <clears throat> so this makes us resemble God, uh, to be created in God's image. But there is a way that we can be more like the God than merely by nature, the nature of man to be body and soul, soul immortal and, um, and spiritual, and endowed with the power of knowing and loving, truth and goodness and enjoying what is beautiful. You see, God has also made us, he made Adam and Eve in his likeness. And a likeness goes beyond the mere image. Uh, when we say of a child, he is the, in the very likeness of his father, we might even say that's true of a, of a, of a statue or a bust. We might say, well, that's a very good likeness. in the sense that we say it's a good image. It has an appearance that looks or resembles this other person. The, the, the bust of Julius Caesar, for example, might resemble as an image the, the, uh, the one who was its subject. But the likeness goes deeper. When we say someone is like his father, we don't just say he appears outwardly to resemble his father, when we say somebody is like his father, we're referring to the things about his character, the way he expresses himself, the thoughts and so on. Like father, like son <clears throat> means that it's not just an image who may have the same freckles, the same uh, red hair, the same uh, large hands or whatever it is of the father. Now we're talking about an image and a likeness and a likeness that goes deeper in the person that makes him resemble the Father not just in the way he appears, but the way he acts, the way he thinks, the way he expresses himself. And so when in sacred scripture we read that God made man in his image and likeness, 
we're saying that by nature God made man in his image, but by likeness he gave him grace, sanctifying grace. And um, of course, Adam and Eve, our first parents, lost that likeness to God, but the image of nature remains there. Man still has an immortal soul, spiritual, and with the powers of knowing truth and loving goodness and enjoying beauty. beauty. And uh, when we're talking about the human intellect by nature, we're talking about the human reason, the power of reason by nature, we're talking about that that image of God in man that is there by nature. The modernist destroys that. The modernist actually destroys what is there by nature in man of God. The modernist, as it were, destroys the connection between the mind and reality. <clears throat> the human intellects, the human reasons, power to know truth is the first thing that the modernist destroys. <clears throat> And in severing the human mind, the human reason, from the power of knowing truth by saying that we are immersed only in a world of appearances, the modernist may as well say that we exist in a world of illusions because the mind can never attain truth, even about the things in the world around us. We have only the appearances of things. We cannot attain to the truth of anything, anything in the world even around us. This is the work of agnosticism, which is born of phenomenalism. But the root is phenomenalism, which St. Pius X refers to, which is the, the philosophy, the root philosophy of the modernist. We have to realize the damage that this does in severing the human mind from truth and reality. Not only has man by sin severed that, that likeness of God that was in him by grace, but now the modernist would ever actually sever that tie even by nature of the human intellect from God. And subsequently, of course, the love of truth, because the will itself is the rational faculty, it is tied to reason. And the intellect is what presents to the will what is good, to be loved. If you take that connection between the human intellect and reality away, then the will is completely unfettered. And even the concept of beauty, you see this in the modernists, you see what they've done. All you have to do is go to St. Peter's Basilica and look at the doors that John the 23rd and Paul the 6th hung on the front of the basilica. See if you have any, any semblance of beauty in these hideous things. Well, this is true all the way through of modernism. It not only sever severs the intellect from reality, it destroys the will's necessary love for beauty and goodness. And this is what we see operative in the modernist church. We see the modernists and what they've done to the morality, the goodness of the soul. And we see what the modernist has done to even the arts and the beauty that should be there. It's chilling to realize that uh, this, this, this disease of the mind, this disease of the mind, this pathology of the mind begins with this divorcing of the mind from truth, the very image of God in man. This is what is being addressed here, actually. I hope I haven't been too obscure that you can actually follow what I'm saying here. I should have it written down word for word, and I don't. But I hope that you can follow the gravity of this error of modernism, why St. Pius X starts there and develops the whole modernist system and all the modernist conclusions from this, this basically uh, severing of the human mind from the image of God that is there in the, now being, the ability to know what is true. It, it is not only, it, it goes a lot deeper than that. Remember St. Saint, Saint, uh, Aquinas, St. Saint, uh, Saint, uh, uh, Augustine, I beg your pardon, St. Augustine was looking for this image of God in man, not only insofar as God is one divinity, but insofar as he is three divine persons. And St. Augustine 
found that image of God in man even insofar as God is three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And he found that, that image of God in man not only as the unity of the divine essence, but as the trinity of persons in God. He found that in the faculties, the very faculties of the soul that we're talking about. So the modernist destroys the image of God in man, not only insofar as God is unity of, of nature, unity of essence, but insofar as God is imaged in man as trinity of persons in the faculties of man. This is a horrible thing to do. It is going to necessarily yield terrible results. We see those results now played out before us in the modern church, the Novus Ordo created by the modernists. I'll move on. St. Pius X says that the modernists tr make a transition from their agnosticism to a state of pure nescience. What does that mean? Well, non-scientia means literally not knowing. So the modernists go from this idea of, well, there's just, we don't, we don't know uh, about God, his existence, and so on. Uh, they go from that state of pure non-knowing to a scientific atheism and an historical atheism. They say that since we can't know God by virtue of the phenomena, the appearances of things that as they come to the human mind, then when we're doing science, because science is entirely about the phenomenal world in which we live, they say, the world of appearances, then when it comes to science or history, which is a form of science, they say, then officially we have to say they're atheists. So they start by saying we can't know about God from phenomenal things, to saying, well, because when we're dealing with the phenomena, then our science and our history have to rule out the possibility of anything of God, his existence, his influence, anything at all. So they turn everything around immediately from one step of denial of, of nescience and not knowing to another step of what he calls positive denial. It's not just an absence of knowledge. Here we have in history, here we have in human science, an absolute statement of refusal, of denial, but ruling out any existence or any possibility of God. And again, it goes right down to the fact that uh, they go from this non-knowing to this complete denial in the category of human thought, natural human thought. They rule out. So they decide that in anything scientific or anything historical, they have to ignore God altogether. It would be a, a serious violation of the principles of their science and their history to allow God any role at all. In, except insofar as that he's a phenomenon. He's a phenomenon. He appears in history only as a phenomenon and one that is totally uncalled for. And St. Pius X goes on to say, yet it is a fixed and established principle among the modernists that both science and history must be atheistic. That's a ground rule principle of theirs. And within the boundaries of science and history, there is room for nothing but phenomena. I just said that. St. Pius X repeats it. God and all that is divine are utterly excluded. That statement sums up his whole point. Everything in modernist system of science and history excludes God as an absolute sacred principle. If they believe anything sacred, that's it. And we're going, to, we're going to soon see the consequences. How does this play out then? How does this play out in matters of faith? How can modernists even talk about faith? And how can they talk about religion? How can they talk about church? How can they even talk about Jesus Christ? How can they talk about that with their fundamental principles, absolutely excluding the very possibility of knowing anything about these things? Well, here's when you get to the heading in the encyclical, vital imminence, you see. 
The modernists have to come somehow explain how, since in history and in science, we have to have an absolute ironclad atheism, the modernist has to explain how in human history there is such a thing as faith, how there is religion, how there is church. They have to explain where it comes from. It certainly cannot come from the intelligence. And so St. Uh, Pius X goes on to explain in section, section, section 7 that agnosticism, though, is only the negative part of the system of modernism, he says. There's a positive side. And the positive side, he says, consists of the principle of vital imminence. Now, I know, again, at, at, uh, you know, people who haven't had the basics in theology or philosophy might check out vital imminence. This is getting a little too deep. It's not. It's not too deep. It just explains how they go from one thing to another. It's actually the bridge that they cross to get from their absolute denial of any natural knowledge of God that we can have to how, in fact, there is such a thing as uh, a very un idea of God, how there is religion. He says, religion, whether natural or supernatural, must, like every other fact, admit of some explanation. I mean, he says natural theology has been destroyed, so you can't have religion as the work of the human mind. He says the road to revelation was cut off by the rejection of arguments of credibility, again, through the human intelligence, that's been destroyed. He says all external revolution has been absolutely, revelation has been absolutely denied by the modernists. So where on earth do we get this very clear phenomenon of religion in human existence as a kind of historical curiosity. Where does it come from then? And he says, it is clear that the explanation for the existence of religion, any notion of God in human history, in the human mind, has to be sought somewhere else, has to be found somewhere else than in man's mind. He says, it must be looked for in man. It comes out of man somewhere. It certainly not, is not in the world around us. We've already ruled that out. So it has to come from somewhere inside man himself. It's not in history, can't be in historical developments. It can't be in science. Nothing of phenomena speak to us of God, at least nothing that we can discern as God. Somehow it has to come out of the life of man, St. Pius X says. The explanation must be found in the life of man. And this is where the, where the modernist goes with this. He says, therefore the principle of religious imminence is formulated by the modernists. What does it mean? Well, you have in the life of man what they call these, these vital phenomena, okay? And man produces these things himself. And the first actuation of this vital phenomenon of man and religion, and religion as this phenomenon, which is produced by man, from man, but not from his mind, belongs to this category of things due to a certain necessity or impulsion. So the first thing he tells us about the modernist way of looking at this is, okay, since we've ruled out the idea that the human intellect or the human mind has any connection with religion or God or faith or anything of the kind, and yet we see in human history the phenomenon of religion, the phenomenon of God, the phenomenon of church and phenomenon of faith, that man has to produce this just out of himself. It doesn't come from the world around him. And so it has to be produced by an, a need. There's an impulsion in man. He needs something beyond himself. He needs something that ultimately he's going to call the divine. Uh, man, in a sense, senses that there is something beyond himself. He needs something beyond himself. And that need is going to trigger something in him. So St. Pius X says that uh, this category of phenomena 
notion of God, religion, faith, whatever, is due to a certain necessity or impulsion, he says. So he says the modernist finds that these things have their origin, more speaking, he says, more particularly of life, in a movement of the heart, not the mind, the heart. And that movement they call a sentiment. So the notions of God and religion and faith and all the rest that follows from them, all of these things follow from a sentiment, they call it. They may even call it the religious sentiment. And since God is the object of, of, of religion, he says, we have to include that, that faith, which is the basis and foundation for all religion, faith itself must consist in a sentiment which is moved by a need. A need for what? A basic human need for the divine. Now, they don't really define what that is. Actually, they can't define what the divine is because it's up to each individual to define his own need, what he needs here, and how that need is filled. But it's just the divine something. Okay? And so here the modernist tells you that yes, there is faith. It did not come from the mind. It has nothing to do with reason or intelligence. It comes from a human need which moves a, something of the heart of man called a religious sentiment. And that need kind of erupts into a kind of experience. Faith, he says, faith, the modernist says, the basis and foundation for all religion begins in that religious sentiment of man which is impelled by some need for something divine, whatever it is, okay? And he goes on to say that this divine is experienced. Experienced, remember the word that's very important, only in special and favorable circumstances. So it's not as though you could experience the divine through your religious sense always and everywhere any more than you might feel the need always and everywhere for the divine. But in your religious sentiment, you as a human, you as having the human condition, you experience this need for the divine only under certain favorable and exceptionable circumstances. But when you do feel that impulse of a need for the divine, which is a, an experience of the heart, not the mind. Then you can experience the divine for yourself in a unique way. So St. Pius goes on and explains that you c it cannot of itself pertain to the domain of consciousness. It actually is latent, that need for the divine that is going to erupt at times into feeling feeling this craving for the divine, which is going to bring you an experience of the divine, that is latent within you. It is latent within your consciousness. And St. Uh, St. Pius X actually appeals to an expression, a term that was fairly recent in his own history, the subconsciousness. We think of Freud and the rest of them, the philosophers. Um, the, the, the psychologists talk about a subconsciousness. That's where the modernist says we find this religious sentiment, which is always there in everyone. With its need for the divine that expresses itself by, in a sense, making this leap of faith that the existentialists talk about and experiencing the divine something, okay? In fact, many human beings don't even know it's there. It's, it's latent within them. The religious sentiment is so latent within them that even atheists have it, but they don't know it because the, the need for the divine has not yet come to the fore, has not yet 
um, taken a step forward and revealed itself to them. But when it does, when it does, they too can have a unique personal experience of the divine. And they experience this within them. This is also a very important point of it. They experience the divine within their religious, within their religious sentiment. And so St. Pius X goes on, should anyone ask how it is that this need of the divine, which man experiences within himself, grows up into a religion? I mean, how do we get from that? How do we get from the idea that the modern is presenting to us that this, this experience of the divine, uh, which is something of the human heart only, it's not rational, it's not intellectual, it's not intelligence. It's an experience. It's a direct experience of the divine something. How does that grow up into a religion? The modernists, again, have to explain this. Because, again, faith and religion and the notion of God, all of these things have expressed themselves in the realm of phenomena. So the modernist has to explain where they come from. If they don't come from the mind, the modernist says they come from the heart, needing the divine, the religious sentiment, then experiences the divine in a very unique and special way for each individual. The modernist says that science and history are confined within the, the limits. The, the one limit is external, like the physical, visible world, and the other limit of science and, the, and history is human consciousness. And St. Pius says that according to modernists, when a, a person reaches the, the limit of this external boundary of the phenomena around him and reaches the internal limit of his consciousness, there can be no further pro progress. So we have our science and our history basically limited by these two things, our internal limits of consciousness and our external limit of the phenomena around us. And outside of that, beyond that, is the unknowable. We cannot go beyond the knowledge of the phenomena around us. Our intellect comes to that limit of the phenomena we witness or experience in the world. The intellect cannot go beyond those. What lies outside of those is the unknowable. But even inside us, where we have our consciousness, beyond the realm of our own consciousness lies the unknowable. We can't know beyond those two things, he says. And when we come up to those, that, those limitations, internally and externally, we find that we want to go beyond those limits. But beyond them is the unknowable that can be known by the by the mind, by the conscious human mind. Now we're getting to the area of the unknowable, which is the realm of the divine. How do we get beyond those limits of what is conscious inside us and the phenomena around us? How do we get beyond them? We have to experience them. That is where the religious sentiment comes in. We experience the reality that is beyond that. If it is reality, that's another question, see. And so there's where the need for the divine comes in. We crave to know what is beyond the limits of our conscious minds and what we can experience here in this world. So there, the need for the divine excites in the soul actually that subconscious need and that subconscious sentiment suddenly arise, awaken, as it were, into that need. We need to know what is beyond the limits of our existence. And that excites in the soul what St. Pius calls a propensity toward religion. 
This excites a special sentiment within us. Not within the mind, but within the heart. The heart is what has to go beyond the limitations of the human mind. The phenomenon the around us, the consciousness within us. And so even though the mind itself hasn't been thinking about these things, the mind itself can't even detect these things. But we're talking about the subconscious, something in the subconscious that is so latent, it needs something to trigger it. And it is that need we experience, as though it's like a cry of the heart, an angst that we feel ourselves bound in by these limitations and we need more. And so it is by this special sentiment in our human hearts that we can experience the reality of the divine by crossing, the, by breaking out of those boundaries. Now, whether it is our own religious sentiment bursting those boundaries or whether it is the divine something breaking through those boundaries into our subconsciousness is another question. St. Pius X himself says, uh, turning on the answer to that question determines whether you're a pantheist or not, he says. Whether that, that divine reality, that divine uh, is really something outside of us or whether it's just something within us, he says. That's something the modernist doesn't really want to get into. But anyway, he says, the fact is the modernists all, regardless of how they answered the question, whether the divine is something real outside of us or just something we're experiencing within ourselves. He says, regardless of whether the modernist answers that question or how he answers it, this is the basic uh, mechanism by which the modernist says we can burst the bounds of our worldly existence, burst the bounds of our con conscious existence to experience the unknowable divine beyond what our minds can know. And he says, it is this sentiment to which the modernists give the name of faith. And this is it, this it is, which they consider the beginning of religion, he says, okay? See, he says that modernism finds in this sentiment not only faith, but with faith and in faith, as they understand it, this is for them revelation. They regard that this sentiment enables us to actually experience the divine that is beyond consciousness and beyond the phenomena, all the phenomena of this world. It is through this religious sentiment and its craving and its need. We, f we see that the modernist says that faith is actually an experience. He's going to get into that a bit more later, which the modernists actually refer to as the faith experience. It's not a matter of, of man accepting revelation that is given to him through his in intelligence to understand truth. That is not it at all. The modernist has ruled that out, even the possibility of it. And he substitutes this cry of the heart, which brings man through his religious sentiment in some kind of contact with the divine, not only outside himself, but beyond himself, even anything he can know. And that experience is something personal, and it is real, and it is true. For each individual, it is true. What he experiences of the divine is his own personal truth of his own personal faith. You will see in the writings of John Paul II, for example, a Per persistent reference to the faith experience, the faith experience, the faith experience. Now this is the language of modernism. And we find it in John Paul's concept of faith is that it is an experience. This is quintessential modernism. Okay? Don't be surprised when you read that, you may say, well, what does he mean by that? He means exactly what they're saying, what St. Pius X is condemning here in modernist lore. That is a belief that faith is an experience of the heart, okay, of the religious sentiment. And St. Pius X here in number eight of the encyclical is talking about the connection between uh, the religious sentiment and the needed experiences of the divine, the unknowable, and how that is satisfied only by this religious experience that the sentiment has 
And how is that tied together with divine revelation? Well, actually, they're saying that uh, the religious sentiment becomes conscious. It actually brings into the realm of consciousness this divine experience. And that is when it becomes revelation, as though the divine reveals itself to the, to the religious sentiment by this experience. And that revealing of itself is revelation. So they've totally changed the very definition of revelation by saying that that moment of, we call it inspiration, whatever you want, the moment of contact of the, divine, of the human need expressed in the religious sentiment, coming in contact, as they say, kind of contact with the divine outside of consciousness and the things of this world, that is the revelation of the divine. And when it comes into consciousness, and therefore they say, and this is what St. Pius X says here, that they make consciousness and revelation synonymous. The, the coming into consciousness of that experience of the divine is revelation, is what they're saying here. They equate religious consciousness with revelation. Again, the consequences of these things are mind-boggling as to what the kind of religion comes out of these principles here. It is not Catholicism. They're redefining all the terms. They're redefining the meaning of faith. They may use the word faith. They don't mean what the Catholic Church means at all. They're redefining the word revelation. They may use the word revelation. It does not mean to them what it means to Catholics. It doesn't mean to them what it means to the Catholic Church. So here they come to um, even the supreme authority of the Church, he says, in number eight of the encyclical. Whether it's the supreme authority of the Catholic Church, the actual Catholic Church, in its external uh, teaching capacity, or in the capacity of a legislator in the province of sacred liturgy or discipline, regardless, they, they say that they put all of these things on an equal footing. The individual's personal experience of the divine with the teaching authority of the church. The teaching authority of the church has no more authority over them than their own personal experience of the divine. That is to them, actually it even comes first. Their personal experience has more power and more authority over them than anything the church might say to them. And uh, you might say, well, well, what's behind that? Remember that the church and faith and all the rest are all phenomena. It's, a, it's coming into their consciousness. All of these things have now entered their consciousness, you see. See, you can't say that one thing has more authority over them than the other. Because now these are all suddenly, because they're within the realm of consciousness, suddenly they all become phenomena. And they're all more or less on the same footing. But there's more to this. I mean, I may realize that, that might, you might get lost with that idea, but uh, just kind of put that in the back of your mind for a minute and still try to stay with me or try to stay with St. Pius X, how he's trying to explain the consequences of the principles that they're enunciating here. Then the next step, St. Pius X says, with this idea of faith being this experience of some unknowable divine, which is kind of burbled or bubbled up in their consciousness to answer their need, is to take this, this, what, this divine that has revealed itself suddenly in their consciousness and to transform it and to dis, disfigure it. St. Pius X talks about what happens next in the modernist mind, he says. Again, we're, we're following the modernist way of thinking of how to explain religion how to explain church. Now, you have to keep in mind here, 
that this is the modernist way of explaining the Catholic Church. This is the modernist way of explaining Jesus Christ. The modernist is trying to explain these phenomena. Faith in Christ. How does a modernist explain these things? Well, this is the start of how the modernist starts explaining to himself where Jesus Christ came from and who he is, where the church came from. This is how the modernist explains not only where all religion comes from, all faith, all church, all, all, all great religious figures. This is the, where the modernist sees Jesus Christ and how the modernist sees the Catholic Church. That's what we're interested in here. And that is what St. Pius X is primarily trying to explain. What does the modernist make of the Catholic Church? What does the modernist make of the Catholic religion? What does the modernist make of the founder of the Catholic religion, Jesus Christ? That's where we're going with this. And this is how we see where the modernist winds up with the anti-Catholic religion, which is going to be the religion of the Antichrist. The modernist goes on to say, therefore, under this heading, Deformation of Religious History and the Consequence, in number nine, he says that this whole thing is a process. We, again, we have to realize that this experience of the divine is part of a process, which is going on in the heart, the religious sentiment. Religion, faith and revelation spring from this very process. And he says one point is of capital importance for the modernists. On account of the, the historical results, I mean, how we historically view Christ, how we historically view the church. They say the, the unknowable that they talk about, this divine which reveals itself, does not just come into the consciousness all by itself, it brings in it has to bring into human consciousness in order to be even make it conscious, make itself conscious. It has to bring phenomena because the human mind can only think in these terms. The human mind can think only in terms of phenomenon, of the phenomenon. And therefore, in order for the religious experience, the experience of the divine, to even enter into human consciousness, it has to come clothed in some phenomena. And that's a very important point, he says, for the modernist to say that. Because faith is expressed in phenomena, in things that a man can a man man's mind can relate to. This is what erupts into a man's life then. Erupting into his consciousness, he finds the faith experience kind of burbles up in like, almost like contained within a bubble, but the bubble is the phenomenon, so to speak. He sees, it's something he can see now, it's something he can touch, it's something he can taste, it's something he can imagine now. It has brought itself within the realm of his thought, okay? of his consciousness in, in the phenomenon. I know that might seem obscure, but when you see where we're going with it, it will all become very clear where the modernist is going. The modernist says now, as soon as that experience of the divine, which we call faith, has expressed itself in some sort of phenomenon or closed itself in some sort of external phenomenon, I mean, e even in terms of things you can imagine, sort of like the, the clothed itself in the phenomena. Now the mind gets to work. Now the mind gets to work on the experience. This is where the intelligence starts coming in here and start playing with this experience. Starts expressing its experience. First of all, by transfiguring it. It transfigures the phenomenon. So the way that the religious experience or the experience of the divine manifests itself in the consciousness immediately puts itself within the realm of human thought. And the human thought begins to play with it. <clears throat> and human thought wants to kind of make much of it, wants to develop the thought. And it, still, it kind of transfigures that experience. It transfigures that experience into something that is not quite the same 
as the experience of the divine itself. So the divine whatever that has manifested itself by this experience now finds that it is immediately being transformed by the human mind into something else, which is a kind of development, which only more or less corresponds to the divine itself. Now you begin to see a process, again, in the, in the modernist mind, that says even, even the experience we have of the divine and the religious sentiment has to undergo kind of a change, that a metamor metamorphosis even for the mind to think about it. And that metamorphosis eh, doesn't really correspond to the original experience or the divine that caused it. So now we're taking one step away from the divine in the first step of the human mind in dealing with this experience. <clears throat> and not only that, but there's a second step. The mind not only transfigures the experience into something else, <clears throat> but then the mind takes the transfigured thing and disfigures it. So what the mind winds up with becomes almost a caricature of the original experience. It doesn't actually ex correspond really. <clears throat> it's, it's two steps removed from what the divine really was. So what becomes a faith when the mind begins trying to think about it, when the mind begins trying to process it, when the human being begins trying to understand faith, the faith experience, he immediately transfigures it and then disfigures it. What becomes of faith then? What has he got left? He says, from these two principles, the modernists deduce two laws. I know we're going from this to that, to the other thing to this and that, and the other thing to laws, principles, etc., etc. But this is the way the modernist mind works. This is how they come up with, in the end, this whole process by which we say, this is the church, this is, this is the people, <laughs> Uh, this is faith, this is so on and so forth. Uh, this is religion. They're still working on trying to figure out how we come to religion here. And here's what they say. There are two principles that give rise to two laws. The principle of transfiguration, the principle of disfigurement give rise to two laws. And when we circle back to unite it with a third that we got from agnosticism, that we can't really know the phenomena, that, we, that all we know, rather, I'm sorry, all we know is the phenomena. We can't know really anything of God, he says. Now we come up with the three principles that give rise to the modernist as a historical critic, which we're going to talk about later. But he just says, look, we're already laying the groundwork for the, where the modernist is going with this. And here he gets to the the question of Christ, and this is very important now because I think all of it's going to come together. If you've stayed with me this long, I think when we apply these ideas to the person of Christ, you're going to see how significant these ideas are. They say, the modernists say, that science and history in the actual person and life of Christ encounter nothing except what is purely human. Remember, science and history, according to agnosticism, according to the, the basic mindset of the modernist, ruling out any, any sense of God or, or the supernatural, that when we look at Christ as a person, we cannot see anything of him except what is merely human. And so, in virtue of their agnosticism, they have to absolutely rule out in the life of Jesus Christ, in the very person of Jesus Christ, anything that would suggest the divine and so on. Anything. And according to their second idea, they're trying to explain now where the, the concept of Christ as being more than human actually came from. So the modernist, when he's asked, okay, well, if, if you, because of the agnostic start, rule out anything divine or supernatural in Christ, and that he was merely, merely human, where does the idea that Christ was not merely human come from? Well, they say, well, we can explain this from the idea of this transfiguration we just told you about. 
the human mind in having the faith experience, immediately the, the thought of, of Jesus transmogrifies itself in a way into the level of phenomena. Now we're talking about the things of this world. And so what faith, the faith experience, the next step is to transfigure the concept of Christ by which we know him through the phenomena that comes into our mind so that we can even think about him, so that we can even think about this experience. And once we get that experience and we, we associate the concept of Jesus with our human concepts, these phenomena, we start transfiguring them. And so we take the historical person of Jesus, who is nothing more but a, an exceptional human being, and we transfigure that, that, that our notion of that exceptional human being into a concept of Christ. Now he's gone from being Jesus to being Christ, in a sense. Transfigured by faith into something superhuman. So we start reading into the things that he does. And we start seeing superhuman powers at work in him. Miraculous powers in him. That he's more than mere man. He's more than mere mortal man. So the modernist will say that you take a miracle, for example, the miracle of the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes to feed the thousands in the, in the wilderness. And the modernist says, well, this is the result of our transfiguring him and lending a significance to this event, which was not really there. It's there only in the process of our transfiguring this faith experience of Christ. The, real, the historical reality was that Jesus moved the minds and the hearts of his disciples to share the food they already had. And so when the Gospel says they have no food, what it means is they had no food for each other. They had no food that they would share. They had food, but they were not willing to bring it out, in a sense, moved by a faith experience. Jesus, the man, moved them to share this food. That was the miracle. It was a moral miracle, not a real substantial miracle, so to speak. And so the early faith community saw this as a miracle of Jesus. And they transfigured it then into the idea, well, he created food by a supernatural power. This is the mind working on the, on the, the mere natural moral mir miracle of Jesus, though. And uh, then the next step, though, uh, of the mind in lending supernatural powers to Jesus to begin the process of turning him into Christ is the process of disfigurement. Now the memory of Jesus is disfigured. Jesus was transfigured in the mind of the disciples during his life. But upon his death, now his memory is disfigured. And it is disfigured by not only making him more than mere man and attributing some supernatural powers to him, now we disfigure the memory of Christ by making him God. <laughs> this is faith. This is what faith does, the act of faith. The, the revelation of the divine uh, entering into consciousness begets this process of faith. Faith is a process, remember, uh, to, the, to, the, to the modernist, <coughs> by which the human mind uh, transfigures and disfigures, then first transfigures and then disfigures <coughs> the very concept of Jesus as man. And so the modernist distinguishes between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. The Jesus of history was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. End of story. That's the end of Jesus of history. 
the Jesus of the G, the Christ now, the Christ of faith is what emerges from the tomb at the resurrection. The Christ of faith, where, where Christ begins living in that memory of those who now carry on his own faith experience as his disciples. Christ lives on only in that faith experience, in others. And they have transfigured, as the apostles and his disciples transfigured him during life. So the faithful to this day disfigure his memory by making him God. And so when the modernist as a historian wants to find out who Jesus really was, he has to strip away all the supernatural, all the disfigurement, all the transfigurement, as it were, strip it all away to come back to the basic historical reality of who Jesus of history really was. He was a carpenter's son, no more, no less. But he had a particularly powerful faith experience, which alone distinguished him from the rest of mankind. It's the same kind of religious experience that distinguished the great religious founders, Mohammed, Moses, Abraham, right? uh, Zoroaster, uh, Buddha. They were all merely human, but they excelled in the, in the sensitivity and the power of their religious sentiment and their need for the divine which led to them having particularly powerful experiences of the divine. But then their minds, like all of the human minds, began to transfigure and to disfigure that experience into what they call the faith experience. But you have to wait here because faith is further disfigured. It disfigured into what? Into propositions, again, phenomena. We have to express this faith <clears throat> in statements. And those statements then become dogmas of religion. <coughs> and religion itself is a further distortion of the original faith experience. And that helps to explain a little bit already why you would see the modernist would say that the faith experience of mankind continues in each and every one of us. And because the faith experience of others who've gone before us was not the last word on truth, it was just a revelation to an individual who shared it with others because it was so powerful. That now all of these experiences all being true, to one extent or another, and now all of them, the truth of them guaranteed by the fact that they have continued down to the present day because they are vital experiences, all of the experiences of Jesus, of Moses, of Buddha, of Zoroaster, all of these powerful experiences which were so unique to these individuals. The very fact that they are all true is guaranteed by the fact that we still have these in the world today, people living off that faith experience of the past, of these various great personages. All of these faith experiences now are, are all converging. And we're all going to converge in bas basically into one common faith experience. You see where this is leading now, right? I'm glad that St. Pius X took that, section 9, to explain where these very airy and gaseous ideas Actually, we're leading. When you apply them to the person of our Lord, then you begin to see just how deadly they are to all real faith and why modernism is the anti-faith, which will give rise to the anti-church, the Novus Ordo, which will give rise to the anti-Christ. And allow me just to finish by looking at section 10 of Pashendi, which kind of draws, draws all this together. St. Pius X says, therefore the religious sentiment, which through the agency of vital imminence, that is, the religious sentiment in the life of man, 
each, each man, each individual man living his life, this vital imminence, this religious sentiment emerges from the lurking places of the subconsciousness. It is the seed of all religion. Or you might even say it is the soil in which the seed, the religious experience, is planted. It is the explanation of everything that has been or ever will be religion. So the modernist leans back and says, therefore, you see, I have explained to you where religion comes from. I've explained to you after telling you where it doesn't come from. It doesn't come from an external divine revelation in the human mind. That's impossible. It wells up within man by vital imminence from his own, his own personal religious sentiment, his own need for the divine, because he's come to the limits of his existence and he needs to go beyond that. And the unknowable then manifests itself to him as a divine. And that original experience then, entering into his consciousness, now begins to be expressed in phenomena. And this is what happens. It is transfigured, it is disfigured. And this is why each man comes up with his own, you might say, his own personal religion from his own personal experience. It's all true. St. Pius X says the sentiment, which was at first only very, very formless, he says, gradually matures under the influence of progress of human life and grows into a religion. It's like the seed of a religion that is planted there. If that experience withers and dies, it had no vital power. It did not have enough truth to remain. But if it continues on, as the Catholic religion did, as the experience of Jesus Christ continued on in his disciples, it has vital power within it. The same is true of Islam. The same is true of Buddhism. He says all religion finds its origin there. Every existing religion finds its origin in this, the modernist says. He says the Catholic religion is not an exception. He says it is quite on the level with the rest. Read what St. Pius X says here. Because the Catholic religion was engendered by this same process, the, prital, the process of vital imminence, in the consciousness of Christ. Our Lord himself, a man, had this need for the divine and experienced the limits of his consciousness and, the world, and his, his contact with the world around him. He experienced the divine and the process began in him of expressing it. And that's where all Christianity came from him. Here's what St. Pius X says about these things. He says these are sacrilegious assertions. They are shocking to a Catholic. He says, but they're not merely the foolish babblings of infidels. There are Catholics, and he says priests, who in his day were already openly professing these things. And they were boasting at that time that they were going to reform the Catholic Church according to these ideas. St. Pius X calls them, the translation is, to reform the Church by these ravings. No wonder St. Pius X spoke as he did. No wonder he wrote this encyclical condemning this. He saw then, in principle, what you and I are seeing now. He saw in the very principles, in the very egg, what, the monster that you and I now see as the Novus Ordo. He says the modernist was even then affirming that our most holy religion in the man, is in the man Christ as in us emanated from nature spontaneously and entirely. And thus there is surely nothing more destructive of the whole supernatural order of faith, of religion, than this. And so he quotes, he, at the end of section 10, he quotes the, the First Vatican Council, saying, if anyone says that man cannot be raised by God to a knowledge and perfection, 
which surpasses nature, that is human nature, but that he can and should by his own efforts and by a constant development attain finally to the possession of all truth and good, let him be anathema. Again, we find already, already in Vatican II the condemnation of the principles of modernism. And St. Pius X, basing himself upon that, the teaching of the Catholic Church, condemns modernism even in the womb as being a monster. The next step is for the modernist to explain where doctrines and dogmas come from. You remember what Francis has said. He has very little use for dogma. He finds that the dogma is rigid and unchanging. He says we have to abandon that concept. Of the, even of the papacy itself, even the church's faith teaching of the papacy itself, we have to abandon that and go to a new model, take a new road for the papacy. That's what we're going to get into next time. Thanks for staying with me. I know it's been a, kind of a, a rocky road now, and maybe I've gone to extremes to try to make the unknowable knowable. <laughs> if I talk about the doctrines of the modernists as something basically unfit for the human mind, it really is unfit for the human mind. But I just wanted to, you know, to understand their ideas enough to follow the path set out by St. Pius X to understand how they arrive at their conclusions and to understand that their conclusions are exactly what modernism is and exactly what we're witnessing happening today in the modernist church of Vatican II and its Novus Ordo. God bless you. I'll see you next time.